You can turn with me again to the book of the Revelation chapter 4. Uh, I did not finish there. Uh, I, I, I hopefully go we'll get through four today and get through to, to chapter five. But uh, we're, we're going to look at, at, at where we left off. And uh, we left off at, at the duties uh, of the uh, people that are there in heaven, what, the, what they are going to be doing. And uh, those that are gathered around the throne uh, that, that are elders and, and all this. I'm trying to find the right slide so that we can, uh, we, we can catch up on what's going on. Uh, here is, is those that are gathered around the throne. And, and it is the, 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 the duties of, of what is going on uh, uh, around the throne. The Bible says that uh, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor, I'm reading from verse number 9 of chapter 4, and thanks to him who sits on the throne who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sit on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. <clears throat> when we see what John is seeing as he has been transported up into heaven, he for the very first time gets a glimpse of what heaven is really like. We get a glimpse because John got a glimpse, and God told him to write it, and so we, we read about it. And we wonder sometimes, what do people do when they go to heaven? People ask me sometimes when I, when I talk about heaven at funerals, well, well, what do people do up there? Well, let me tell you what's transpiring and taking place among those that are around the throne. They worship. Uh, that's the main thing about heaven. We sing a song about seeing all of our loved ones up there in heaven and being reunited with them and what a glorious day that is going to be. That is true. We will see them. We will recognize them. We will know them. But, but the, the, the significant figure there in heaven is God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and we spend our time... Not talking about, well, do you remember what went on in the Baptist church back there where we were a long time ago and what went on? No, we spend our time worshiping God. We find out that, that the elders fall down and, and, and they cry out and, and they say, Lord, you're worthy and, and you receive glory and honor and praise and, and because you created all things and, and, and by your will they exist and were created. And then we fly, find out that there are beings there, created beings, and I will talk about them. And, and, and they fly through heaven and, and, and they are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We find out that they are there praising God as well. And we're going to talk about cherubim, cherubim and seraphim in, in just a little moment. So we notice that, that there are some sights and there are some sounds that, that are in heaven. And, and, and the duties that they have, they are to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. The next thing that you will notice about them, and you can see the picture of them as the elders, as they fall down and worship and they take off their crowns of gold that God has given to them because of their rewards, and they use that as a symbol of worship, uh, of casting their crowns before him. And that was the text that I just read there for, for, for you, where they give glory and honor and do all of that kind of stuff. But you can read it for, for yourself. Uh, but, but the next thing that you notice is that there are some sights and, and, and some sounds that are in heaven. And, and once again, uh, we review the, the scripture and it says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and the sound of many waters 
as the sound of a mighty thundering saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. I want to read again Revelation chapter 4, uh, 1 through 8, uh, 4 through 8. And it says, Round the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads, and from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal in the midst of the throne, and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. And the creature had a face like a, a, a man. The fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The first one like a calf. The third living creature. So we, we find out that these four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and, and who is to come. We, we find out that, that they are sights and sounds that surround the throne of God that, that John saw. And these sights and sounds were, were, were given to us. And, and, and there's the scripture that I just read, and I should have put it up before there. But, but listen, lightnings and thunderings and voices where God makes his presence known it is a throne of judgment that that john is seeing and that the 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 lord jesus is next to the throne that we'll see later but god himself in all of his his radiant glory is is sitting there on the throne and in the book of hebrews chapter 10 verse number 31 said it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of, of the living God. This is from Exodus 19. When God gave his commandments on Mount Sinai, the mountain was ablaze with, with fire. You remember that, that, that the people had been led out of Egyptian slavery and bondage. There were about two million plus People that are there, they traveled across the Red Sea. They, they'd come to the desert and to the mountain of Sinai. And, and they were there. And, and, and when they get, got there, God made his appearance. And the first thing that they noticed that that mountain was ablaze with fire. There was a thick cloud of smoke. The Bible says, as the smoke of a furnace. There were thunders that came from the mountain. The mountain shook and the voice of God was as loud as a trumpet, exceedingly loud. In fact, it was so awesome and so powerful that it sounded like a volcanic eruption that was taking place. Not just sounds, but the ground was shaking. And the people of Israel, those, those two million plus people said, we're not going nowhere near that mountain. Moses, you go up there and, 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 and you do that thing. Because God had said that nobody comes up on this mountain, no animal, you better fix it all. Because if they even touch this mountain, they're going to be killed. And so Moses afterwards, through the writing uh, uh, of the book of Hebrews, said, and so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. I think the King James maybe gets it a little better when it translates it. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. You understand that just what he was seeing and what he was hearing would terrify human individuals this is the same thing that is taking place there in heaven that that it is not a silent experience it is that from the throne of god there is lightnings and thunderings and voices that are coming out of that throne and 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 that people are experiencing the throne of the judgment of God, and it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 
Later, as we study the great tribulation and the great white throne judgment, we're going to see more of what is transpiring and taking place. Then there are, the Bible said, lamps of fire that are there. I don't know what's on the next slide, so I'll just take a chance and, and see what it says. Uh, lightnings and thunders and voices started it out. Then there are lamps of fire. There, there are seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which were the spirits of God. The seven spirits of God are described as the fullness of, of the spirit of God. And we understand that the spirit of God, his work in the world, is to convict or to convince the world of sin and righteousness and of judgment to come. And that is the way he draws people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the judgment is going to be based upon the fact because the Spirit will testify to every word, every motivation, every deed, and all of all who stand before the judgment. The Spirit of God knows the time, the place, the act, the motive, the deed, the results, the influence, and the consequence of every sin Sins of omission, sins of commission, and sins of presumptions. And the Holy Spirit knows the where, the why, and the what of everything that is done and everything is recorded concerning our life without books that are preserved for the final day of judgment. And most of this will come as we see the angelic creatures and their constructions and their duties at later in chapter 20 at the great white throne judgment. So we have there the very fullness of God who knows everything that is about everything that is going on down here and that they are recorded. Now what about the saints of God? Everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that we think is recorded in the books. And those things that are sins of omissions, things that you didn't do, sins of commission, those things that you did do, those sins of presumption that you just took it for granted and did it anyway without God's permission, all of those are recorded. And you said, well, will there be a payday for that? Well, there's already been a payday for that. The very moment that, that, that we were saved, Jesus has paid for those sins of a believer. And the Bible says that he has blotted them out of the record books concerning us. So when you go into the halls of heaven and you find the uh, library uh, 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 of God and you go and see the filing cabinet that, that is there for all the people where all the records are you just pull over the, the filing cabinet and you find the folder and it's going to be a very thick one of John Hambright but when you open the folder there's nothing there it's all been transferred to Jesus on the cross where he died for our sins according to the scripture. He's taken those out of the way, the Bible says, and the, he's having nailed them to the cross. Not just past sins, not just present sins, but even future sins that, that we have. They have been paid for by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not so for those people that are lost. Those things are recorded and they're recorded in books. And we'll look at those books that, that they have and, and, and that they are still there testifying as evidence that, that we didn't or those people did not know the Lord Jesus as their Savior. So we find out that there is the spirits of God that is there. And then... The next thing that the Bible tells us about that throne room is that it is a sea of glass. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. Now, nothing is more fluid than, than, than water. Nothing is more fluid than the sea. It is constantly changing. 
with the winds and the seas and the waves that, that roar, they are never the same. But when John saw the sea, he saw it before the throne as it was a sea of glass. It was clear and it was a solid. It was not a liquid. It is set. It is unchangeable. And it is clear like, like glass. This is the judgment of God. Everything there is unchangeable and it is clear as crystal. It is fixed and it is beyond recall. There's no court of appeals concerning the case that stands before humanity. He is standing before the ultimate supreme court of God whose decisions and whose judgments are without question and they were without alterations. When Paul was writing to the church of Rome in chapter 1, he was sitting writing to the church at Rome and he is going to prove that, that all of humanity, whether they are Jews or Gentiles, are going to be guilty as they stand before God. And then he will later explain this, the salvation that is offered. And to humanity... World humanity that does not have the law as the Jews had the law. He says, by the very things of creation, that the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth forth his handiwork, and day unto day they utter speech, and night unto night they utter knowledge, and they, there is no sound uh, that, that they have not, not heard. There, there, there's no community where, where their voice is never heard. All a person has to do is to look at creation, and, and the creation declares the glory of God. He can't, can't say, I, I didn't know God because of all creation. But he also said that they are guilty because those things that may, may be known of God have been placed in, in them. They have a conscience that is there. And until that conscience is seared over or, 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 or to the, what we call a heart is hardened, they, they know about God. You can ask little kids, do you believe in God? Yeah. Well, where did they get that knowledge? Because it's in the mind of a kid. Communists say, if you can give me a kid... Till he's five years old, he will always be a communist. Why? Because they indoctrinate those young minds of those kids that there is not a God. They are atheists. And he said that they will always be atheists, according to the communist doctrine. Why? Because we took the knowledge and the conscience of a little bitty kid and we changed it. And we made it to where it was a conscience that was seared and it was hardened about the knowledge of God. But God says, hey, I've placed into people the very knowledge of God. The fact of who we are. The very fact that, that, that we are a, 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 of a unique design and, and that we have been patterned in emotion and intellect and will after God himself that is there where, where man cannot come before God and say, well, God, you know, I just really didn't know that you existed. God said, hey, it's true. And then he says in verse number 17, I believe it is, verse number 7, he said that they stand before God without excuse. The word excuse means they stand before God without any defense whatsoever. There's not anything that they can say that can plead their case before a just and, and a righteous God. There's not anyone there that will be their advocate, that will stand up there and, and say, listen, God, you, you, you need to take this guy into consideration about why he did this, where he went, all of the things that he did on earth. No, it, it's all there. And it is open and bare to him the Lord himself who sits upon that throne. So we find out that they are there 
before that sea of glass and that judgment is fixed, it's set and it is clear as crystal before them. And then the next thing that you see is that you see these four living creatures. We're, we find that in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. Now these living creatures are what we call cherubs. We say cherubs, they say cherubim. They're created angelic beings. They are creatures, which means that they have been created. They're created things. And they're not little plump babies that you see on Valentine's Day with little bitty small wings on their back and they got a little bow and arrow and his name is Cupid. And he draws back his bow and he shoots it into the hearts of lovers on Valentine's Day. No, uh, this is not what it is. Cherubs are the highest in the rank of all of created intelligence. And he was from that group which Lucifer fell from because he, Lucifer was the anointed cherub. He's the one that sat over all the other cherubs that were there. And we find out that their part and their plan in the program of God is to be around the throne. And they were first introduced into the Garden of Eden with man's expulsion. And they are powerful creatures because God set one into the entrance of the Garden of Eden and, and he had a flaming sword that, that turned in, in every direction. And, 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 and they are, are, are the heavenly host. When we find in the Bible, we read about the heavenly host. This is heaven's armies. That God has armies of angels. They're, they're, they're mighty, fighting, created beings that, that, that God has. And if we were doing a study of angels, then we would find out that, that these angels are intelligent and that they are powerful and they guard the very throne, the very presence of God. And in a moment, we're going to find out just how many that they are. The Bible says not only are they intelligent, but they're full of eyes which sees things and, and knows things. Our eyes are for seeing. We, we, we're able to see and we become aware of things and that increases the intelligence that, that we have. Now our eyes are positioned in the front of our head or the front of, of our face. And all that we are able to see is within 180 degrees what we call peripheral vision. That I can see the piano or whatever that is. So if that's drums. <laughs> and my intelligence wouldn't let me know that they're drums. I can see them but I don't comprehend them like I do when I see this way. I can, I can see who they are. And I can find out that that's all that, that I, I, can, I can see looking forward. I can see my fingers. And, 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 and I know that because my vision goes this way. But recently, just recently, doing a study about eyes and where God put them. He didn't put them in the same place for everything that, that he has created. And I was studying about deer, the, the, the animal deers, and, and what they see. And why tell deer make a, a, a wonderful example of, of eyes and that God put them on the side of a deer's head where he puts ours in, in, in front. And they are there so that a deer can see what's in front of him, but he also sees what's behind him. Most animals have their eyes on the side of their head, and they do that. 
If you want to hide from a deer so that he cannot see you, you have to be standing at his tail because he can't see his tail. He can see everything else all the way around him, almost 360 degrees. And, and so there's only a small portion that, that a deer can't see and, 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 and like our eyes. A deer has on the inside of those, they have rods and, and cones. The rods are to be able to distinguish movement. The cones are there to distinguish color. We have same rods and cones in, in our human eyes. But they have intensified the fact of deer's eyes have more rods than they have cones. And so they're able to see movement more precisely than we as human beings, and they're able to process it ten times quicker than us. Now, ladies, I know I'm talking to mostly men when I'm talking about deer and, and what they're able to do and what they're able to see. There was a question that was put before an old successful deer hunter, and it was about all this camouflage clothing that men spend tons of money on so that they can go deer hunting so that the deer won't be able to see them. And there are different patterns that are there in, in that clothing that they have. It started when there was a fellow that walked into a clothing factory and he had in his hand a handful of sticks and dirt and limbs and stuff and he laid it down upon the desk of one of the vice presidents and he said, can you make something that looks like this? And he said, well, certainly I can. And that's where camouflage clothing came from. They wanted it to look like the outdoors that is out there so you can fit in with, with, with it so deer can't see you. And all of the manufacturers jumped in and they started coming out with different colors and different patterns and all of this stuff. So they asked this successful deer hunter concerning camouflage. And they asked him which one was the best pattern that if you're going to hunt deer. And here was his answer. He said, if you're sitting absolutely still, and you need to do that if you're deer hunting because they have all of these rods in there that are 10 times better than human eyes and they can see you and process it more quickly. He said, if you are sitting absolutely still, it doesn't make a difference. And if you move, it doesn't make a difference. Because they process, and, and some of you that are deer hunters are shaking your head, you know that, that movement is one of the things that God has given to them because they have more rods in their eyes than, than we have and can process it ten times faster. And, 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 and if you try to get into a staring contest with a deer, he will win every time because you'll blink your eyes. And he can pick up on that, and he'll be gone before you can get your little gun up. But on the same time, he doesn't have as many cones in his eyes as we have. And cones are, are what helps us to distinguish colors. A computer company printed not long ago that they have a computer that can print a million Colors, and by the way, they only use four colors to start with in that printer. And they did that under the concept that we as humans can see a million different kinds of colors. Now, I'm not smart enough to distinguish that. I'm colorblind in some areas, and, and my blues and greens kind of get all mixed up. And you can tell that sometimes by the way I dress. But I thought that growing up that there were only eight colors because that was how many colors was in the little box that I had. 
And them kids that had the 64 color boxes, I didn't have anything to do with them because they, they, were, they, they lived way up here and I, I was from Walker County. But deers don't see colors like we see colors. There's colors that, that, that to them are, are just bland. Blaze orange that hunters wear and required to wear when they go in the woods. When a deer sees that, it looks about like the color of this wood here. It just looks like a cardboard box to them. They don't see bright blaze orange because of the cones in, in, in their eyes. Reds and oranges to a deer uh, 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 appear to just be a, a, a bland color. Lower colors on this spectrum like blues, th th they're able to see that. So a hunter goes in there and he's got all this fancy camouflage on. And then he has a blaze orange vest on about the, about the color of that shirt there that man's wearing. And, and deer don't recognize that. that. That's just a cardboard looking wood color to them that, that doesn't make any difference because in the environment in which they live, they don't need to distinguish colors. They live in there where there's just leaves and twigs and, 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 and green and, and, and trees and things like that. They're, so for safety reasons, we wear blaze of orange uh, when we're, we're out hunting without being perceived by a deer. Deer also have these big old eyes. And these big old eyes have big old pupils that can open extremely wide and therefore, they see better in the dark than we do. And we call those nocturnal because they're night creatures. Now, one day you're going to be glad that you learned all this. You just wait. But we're getting back to the cherubim. And the Bible says that they have eyes in the front and they have eyes in the back. Now, people say, well, he has eyes in the back of his head. No, we don't. We have eyes in the front of our head. But cherubim are different. And, 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 and they're, they're like, like nothing else. They have more than two eyes, more than humans or more than animals. And this multiplicity of eyes means that they can see and that they can process everything. That's what these created beings were for. It's because that they see and they process everything and their su superior intelligence and their many eyes says that they see and they know everything that is going on and they are recording angels and they're writing them in a book. And they're not written in shorthand. They go ahead and they use the alphabet. And that basically sums up what is taking place with, with these, these creatures and the sights and the sounds that are around the throne with those creatures, with those elders, and the activities of worship that is taking place. So to continue with the heavenly scene, there is another chapter, and that's chapter 5. And we'll get to that one week after next. And we're going to see some more about what John saw when he got there to heaven. Because introduced to him is going to be someone else and all that goes on around him. And I'll wait and surprise you about who that someone else is. But you probably already know because you're pretty perceptive. And you probably already read chapter 5.